of lunchtime conversations uh, run by uh, History and Archives in Practice, also known as HAP, which is a partnership between the Institute of Historical Research, the National Archives, and the Royal Historical Society. My name is Philip Carter. I'm the Academic Director at the Royal Historical Society, and it's my very great uh, pleasure to welcome you to this third and final in our conversations, where we'll be hearing from three speakers, Stephen, Rosie, and Sarah, from the University of Stirling, about their pandemic oral history project. Just before we get on to uh, today's presentation, uh, a little housekeeping uh, before we start. Uh, for anyone attending who may have a visual impairment, I'll offer a brief description of myself. I'm a white middle-aged man with short dark hair wearing a blue shirt. The session will last for 45 minutes. Uh, we're going to hear from Stephen, Rosie and Sarah uh, very shortly, who are going to introduce their project uh, and provide uh, brief uh, presentations. Um, and then we'll have a short conversation between the four of us about uh, subjects arising from their talks and also from their video, which uh, was shared before the event. And, and I should say, if you haven't had a chance to watch the video, I would strongly recommend it. It is an extraordinary, uh, moving and powerful piece of work in which uh, historians and archivists work together, which is exactly what history and archives and practice is all about. After that, we're going to move to your questions um, for the final uh, 15 or 20 minutes of the session. So as questions occur to you throughout the uh, discussion, please do add them to the Q&A function, uh, which you can see at the foot of uh, your browser. Um, and then we'll come to as many of those as we can uh, before we finish at 1.45. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce uh, our three speakers uh, this afternoon. Um, Dr. Stephen Bowman, is lecturer in history at the University of Stirling and co-founder of the university's Creative Histories Research Group. And we'll be hearing more about Creative Histories uh, later on uh, this lunchtime. In addition to the COVID oral history project, he is currently studying the cultural memory of the Scots-born founder of the US Navy, John Paul Jones, and is co-editing a forthcoming book on Glasgow and the United States to be published by Peter Lang. Rosie Almola is University Assistant Archivist and Archivist for the NHS Fourth Valley and Scottish Political Archives at the University of Stirling. Rosie co-chairs the Scottish University's Special Collections and Archives Group and is also Reviews and Obituaries Editor for the journal Archives and Records. And our third speaker this afternoon is Sarah Bromwich. Uh, Sarah is head of the University of Stirling Collections and has experience of working across museums and archives where she's particularly interested in contemporary collecting. She acts as accreditation mentor for Dunblane Museum, treasurer of university museums in Scotland, and sits on the collections advisory committee for the University of Dundee. So with introductions done, I'll now hand over to uh, Stephen, Sarah and Rosie for their presentations. Over to you. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen briefly and start our um, slides. We've just got a couple of slides to do kind of brief um, introductions uh, to the, sort of the project and what we did um, before we kind of dive into uh, questions. So I'm hoping everyone uh, can see that. Um, you'll see an awful lot of these sort of uh, images as we go through. These are some of the animation stills from the film and we we love the artwork so much, so we use them sort of wherever we can. Um, yeah, here, yeah, here's another one. Um, so I'm gonna start uh, by talking a little bit about um, the pandemic archive here at the University of Stirling and sort of what came before we started the oral history project particularly and how it kind of fits into um, to what we were already doing. Uh, a lot of, um, Archivists on the call may have experienced uh, very similar at the start of um, the sort of UK national lockdown in 2020, sort of thinking about contemporary collecting for the first time and wondering uh, how to keep audiences engaged when they can kind of physically come through the doors and, um, and use your archive like normal. And a lot of archive services did sort of start similar projects. Um, so what we did where we called out for um, diaries, videos, images, I'll talk a little bit more about um, what kinds of material we had done um, contemporary collecting before here at the university, the Scottish Political Archive, 
um, kind of practices contemporary collecting continuously for election ephemera um, particularly, but for lots of other little pockets as well. So um, Sarah and I were used to contemporary collecting, but with sort of very specific parameters and it had been going for such a long time. So we were, um, we had quite a good network for that kind of particular project. Um, so this was still a little bit new for us, um, still trying to uh, kind of translate that to um, not just the political archive. So uh, as I say, we called out for kind of three things mainly. We called out for um, diaries or kind of written contributions. Um, we called out for images that were mainly around how sort of rules and regulations relating to the pandemic were kind of manifesting um, themselves in local communities. And we called out for um, videos, and these were kind of primarily um, around things like the clap for carers on Thursday night, um, things that we thought were very sort of intrinsically yeah. um, to, to do with the pandemic, to do with lockdown, and might easily get sort of lost and forgotten. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, the video strand was the least well submitted to, um, but the uh, the images uh strand was was very well submitted we have um we have hundreds of images um throughout 2020 primarily but uh 2021 and sort of into 2022 as well and they're sort of weird wonderful bright moving um really wonderful record of the period uh, and we do we do have a, a nice sort of small range of diaries as well um we ran a diary writing project at the university as part of um, it's called the Be Connected program here at the university, which was the sort of mental health and well-being um, program uh, put on for staff and students during the pandemic and um, continues to this day. And um, we do have um, some really wonderful submissions from that, um, some of which we we use in, in the film. Uh, if you've seen uh, the film or if you might go on to watch it. So this was all sort of um, happening at the at the sort of start of the UK national lockdown. And this was kind of the context for when um, Stephen came up with the idea for an oral history project that would um, look at how staff and students at the university were experiencing the pandemic and um, we decided to to keep those oral history interviews with all of this other material um, in our pandemic archive. Uh, so I'll pass on to Stephen now to chat about the, the kind of interview process um, itself and the project outputs, the kind of key project outputs. Yeah, thanks, Rosie. So um, we conducted the interviews across two phases, if you like. The first phase focused on staff at the university um, who, as you'll see in the film and in the article, come from a variety of different uh, backgrounds and had various different experiences either on campus or off campus during the course of lockdowns. Um, Rosie, uh, Sarah and I did the interviews of uh, staff. We didn't advertise for student uh, volunteers uh, to come on board with the project and for them to interview uh, other students as well. So we were keen to, to involve students at that stage uh, as, as interviewees um, and they were able to, we felt, engage more directly with student inter interview, uh, interview, interview, interviewers and interviewers, uh, yeah. <laughs> both of them. <laughs> students go on better than us doing it, is what I'm trying to say. Um, so across those two, those, those two phases, we had about, I think, 40 or so interviews across uh, both staff and students. Um, we think uh, a very rich uh, resource. It's 40 staff. 40 staff and 21, 21 students. students. Okay, so 61 um, separate interviews or so. Um, they were all done on Teams because when we first began the project, it was still quite early on. It was in 2021, and it was still the sense that for public health reasons, you would be um, conducting this kind of work online uh, via MS Teams rather than doing it uh, in person. So the, the interviews are all uh, recorded uh, remotely online, which you know, maybe we can discuss later, does have, as a, and Sarah can talk more about this, having had more experience of oral history, but it does come with other um, you know, considerations that you may not expect with, with other um, forms of recording. But um, having done the interviews, um, I was kind of keen for us to try and use them, not just to have them on on the archive, but to actually use them. And so we went about trying to uh, produce an article, a co-authored article amongst ourselves, but also involving the students and also incorporating uh, this film that hopefully you have a chance uh, to look at. Um, 
we felt we feel that the that the collection is uh, fairly unique. Um, I'm not aware of any other uh, university oral history projects quite like it. Um, so we're keen to showcase it. Um, I say that it's not you know it's not a, an official history um, of the pandemic from the point of view of Stirling University. It is. I'm glad Philip he found it to be emotional. It is essentially an emotional, uh, fragmentary, um, and provisional account of the. Uh, pandemic from the perspective of the project team, staff, um, and students. And the the article, the film, we've conceived of as one thing, one intervention, which we hope demonstrates the potential and meaningful collaboration between archivists, historians, um, and art curators. The so the, the whole sort of what was interesting about it, and what I was especially keen to do with the article and film was to think about new ways of presenting um, historical research. So that's why there's a film and why the article itself, which is published on um, the UCL Press uh, open access publication, Paper Trails, The Social Life of Archives and Collections, takes a form it does, which is essentially a series of montages of kind of select quotations from the interviews put alongside other source material, newspaper um, excerpts, for example, but also um, images, um, works of fiction that have nothing to do with the pandemic, but which together um, help communicate, if you like, um, the emotional reality of, of the pandemic. And we went about producing that through um, techniques and um, processes that perhaps are more common to creative uh, writers. For instance, we held various workshops, we, we used uh, writing prompts, we had different, um, you know, we came together as a team to produce this work together. So that idea of creative history was really important to me and it was kind of embedded right from the start in how we went about using the materials, responding to the materials and then presenting it in the course of, of the article and the film. Um, as Rosie mentioned, uh, we hired an animator who's produced this lovely work, uh, a man called Gregor Forbes, who's a really um, up and coming um, student animator. He's won, won various awards already. And also, uh, Connor Bristol, we hired a musician um, to produce uh, new music, to compose new music for us, which itself is a response uh, to the archival uh, material. So, um, yeah, we're pretty proud of the outputs, which are. As I say, taking together this article and this film, um, which uh, hopefully you get a chance to, to, to sort of read and to watch. But I think, yeah, I think that's pretty yeah. much. Yeah, that's well, the, the um, yeah. So, oh yeah, that was, th these are all our sort of fantastic collaborators that we wanted to, um, to shout out to. Uh, and then uh, Sarah, just briefly before we kind of move on to the Q&A part, is going to chat to us a bit about the sort of public engagement element and the kind of afterlife slash next steps of the project. Yeah, thanks both. Um, yeah, talk a little bit about public engagement. Now we've got the archive of the film, we really want to kind of utilise it to engage with the general public to sort of discuss themes around memory and memorialisation. Um, as I look after museum collections at the university, I was always really interested in other creatives' responses to the, the pandemic um, and the Pandemic Archive six along museum collections exploring how artists and other creatives responded to uh, COVID. And our COVID project generally um, feeds into the wider Scotland-wide Remembering Together project. Um, Remembering Together, for those of you who don't know it, is a Scottish government funded initiative to co-create memorials which honour the people that we've lost, mark what has been lost and changed in our lives and preserve the best of what we've learned um, during the COVID pandemic. And artists have been commissioned in every one of Scotland's 32 local authorities to co-create COVID memorials with people and communities. And these memorials have taken on various forms from banners, from shelters. There's a COVID tartan. There's even very excitingly a COVID jukebox with a playlist, which I'm very excited about. Um, and Remembering Together are depositing their national archive with the university in our archives. And uh, this material alongside with the film um, and also 
advertising the article will be exhibited in the university gallery from August this year until next September as part of the art collections year of human experience, um, which explores how different people respond to societal changes. So the idea of the exhibition with the film being on in the gallery for the whole academic year means that it can tie into public engagement programs and we've got planned symposium talks and workshops which will draw on the exhibition and the film for inspiration. It includes the kind of national closing event for Remembering Together um, and a potential research project involving children's perceptions of the pandemic which will lead them to make exhibitions in their own classrooms. So we hope that by having the sort of film on display and the archive in the gallery space for the full year, that there'll be opportunities to kind of re-engage with the themes of the archive and to hopefully elicit further sort of creative responses to the kind of creative response that we've we've created. So we hope that it'll continue to kind of snowball out and we'll get a lot more from that in the next coming year. So that's probably enough from me for the time being to the questions. Yeah, great. We can we can kind of leave it there. Um, all the QR codes just for easy access to to kind of various links. But that's um, yeah, I think that's us on kind of brief intro for sure. Great. Actually, Thank you. Like shop stop sharing is that more helpful? Thank you very much, Rosie, Stephen, and Sarah for that um brief introduction to the many different and and evolving and continuing dimensions to this project. And that's one of the really striking things is that you know this is a this is continuous history and people are still working through it and so on and one of the questions I, I I wonder whether people will ask is how are people responding to the historical material now even though it's you know it's a couple of years on uh people's attitudes are different but Sarah if I could start with you um obviously I mean it, this was such a momentous event it was so unexpected um it came very rapidly from occasional newspaper uh, comments early in early in 2020 to, to being a, a, a situation that no one had had any uh, experience of. And we quickly tipped from things that were intelligible and were able to reference to things that were beyond our you know, previous existence. And you set up, a, and clearly a lot of people set up archive projects at this time. People were thinking about this and there's a sort of, people will probably look back and say this was a, this was a moment of archive generation because of the awareness of this and you did something very similar clearly with the oral history project I mean did you have set goals or expectations of what might come from it when you began um and if so I mean how successful has it been and how do you measure success in a project like this yeah I think it's really interesting because um I come from a background where I, I did previously look after the political archive and um uh, trying to do historic interviews looking at the 79 devolution referendum and speaking to people who didn't remember anything, who were a supposedly key political figures in that campaign, I kind of realized that a lot of things do get lost in the kind of midst of time. So I was really keen that we started doing the interviews quite quickly on. And I know some people feel it should maybe wait until later, but I was very keen that we kind of captured the experience and the emotion of it and how we experienced it while it was still fresh in our memory. I know even now um, things that we look at in the interviews like, oh, I don't remember that. But at the time it was so kind of, you know, we all lived within sort of different tiers where we couldn't move areas and that kind of tier system, which was so important to us at that point, I don't really remember it now, but some of the interviews very clearly kind of chronicle what it was like living through it. There are certain periods in the interviews where we feel like we're talking and interviewing. Um, it's There's a sense that COVID's over and then we know now the second lockdown was to come. So it definitely captures a certain period within the pandemic. And, and I think that experience would be different if you interviewed later what we would know and what we would remember would be different. So in some ways, I think it, it is limited because you've only got that experience. But in other ways, it's really vibrant in terms of the experience of it. And I do think it's been, for us, quite successful in kind of capturing one institution and how we variedly experienced it. People like Stephen and I were back on campus very early and we... um 
talk about working and then we have in we have interviewees uh, lecturers who were never in on university campus for two years and worked remotely so the experience is really different so I feel the success is trying to get a broad range of the different experience of how people who worked in this one institution experience what happened to us maybe Rosie and Stephen want to ask well, I suppose um yeah the, the kind of broad range within the institution I one of the things that um I know we, we sort of set out with was a bit of a wish list of the kinds of um, sort of staff members and students that we that we could interview um, and we did want to cover such a broad spectrum and inevitably there were um, there were staff members uh, such as us cleaning staff we would have really loved to talk to someone from cleaning from catering people who were on campus when lots of us weren't um, that we actually didn't manage to get um, interviews from and and part of that is the way we were going about the project remotely and part of that is we really didn't want to nag people in case it was um actually emotionally difficult you know um so so i suppose there are there are gaps in um in our wish list of people that we really wish we had spoken to but um but i think one of the ways of measuring the success is that people find things like the article and the film emotive and that's really um wonderful to see people's responses to that and I certainly think watching the film, one of the really clever structures of, of your project is to take the university as an institution, um, because it gives it a defined uh, parameters that you can look at. And I was very struck. There's a wonderful moment in it where you interview the head of security and he's walking around thinking which doors lock because I have to close the the the, the buildings, the building in, 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 in its entirety. And and so it's it's a very interesting record both of people's experience the work that they had to do and and obviously there are many people you weren't able to identify uh some of the strange things that were happening in march 2020 that you know we didn't know about uh but also the emotional dimension and rosie i, I wondered i mean in terms of you, you you mentioned the 61 people who were involved in the project in the round did um were people forthcoming in in and i mean presumably some people wanted to speak and found it helpful some people perhaps didn't want to speak um and then presumably you got a range of experiences that not all experiences were necessarily negative that this this could be a time that was different and if you were safe and secure and so on you know it was very we all remember how you know the weather was good and so on it, people spoke in the film about this so i wonder what you could say about the, the different responses and who who came along and and, and gave their opinions yeah um that's that's a great question um so i i suppose i w i was quite mindful um particularly because i've i've been um chatting about oral history in terms of being the nhs portfolio office and there was an awful lot of discussion in early 2020 about uh, oral history to do with the medical profession and how ethical or unethical that might be so when we kind of came to do our own oral history project i was very mindful that i didn't want to put pressure on anyone to, to have an interview if they didn't want to because some people would maybe really not want to talk about their experiences but there's some people would find it very cathartic or just um actually they hadn't had bad experiences and therefore it wasn't a problem to talk about so um the ask was quite polite and like I say we didn't really um badger people you know even though we would have loved to talk to certain different types of staff certain different types of students from different um divisions and faculties we didn't book folk because we didn't we just didn't want to put that pressure on anyone so it is a, it's a very self-selecting group of people um but everyone we interviewed um all came forward voluntarily <laughs> you know we, we put these call outs and and we just sort of waited to see who we got back so we did get back um plenty of uh people who were interested um i i'd say of, of the sort of initial emails we got back of people who were interested not everyone then had an interview with us some people kind of fell off the radar didn't really um get to interview point but that was kind of entirely their call we let them kind of shape that um with the varied experiences yeah we I'd say actually all three of us maybe struggled with that a little bit it's it's fair to say that um we were pretty firmly united in the fact that none of us enjoyed uh lockdown we had pretty difficult experiences and um I sort of certainly just assumed that was true straight across the board. I couldn't really imagine anyone sat at home having a good time. 
Um, and then it turned out people did. And we <laughs> we interviewed people. Um, and yeah, I would ask the question, imagining I was going to get quite a negative response. And then somebody had just had a crack in time and really loved working from home. And, um, you know, people bought dogs and like it just <laughs> were sort of living their best lives. And it and it could it could sometimes be really difficult um, getting off that call and thinking, oh, that, oh that, well, that's really nice <laughs> for, for you. Um but then there's also a large extent to which I think, again, this is true for all three of us, we found it therapeutic to do the interviews as well. Um, so it, it sort of swings and roundabouts on on that score for me, I think. I don't know if Sarah, do you want to join in? Yeah, jump in, but... no, I was going to say, yeah, I think we were very conscious, I think, specifically of the student interviewees who were taking interviews the there were kind of self safeguarding issues around them doing interviews and I know that a couple of the in fact it's in the film one of the interview was talks about the fact that they found it difficult doing interviews with people who had had a great time and felt that it reflected on them that they had struggled so much so we we tried to sort of think about how we would cope with that and did regular sort of check-ins with our um, student interviewers to make sure that they were okay and they were coping and also we were conscious that um, you know some we've I interviewed people who'd who'd lost family members so it it you know having to deal with those kind of emotions as well was was sometimes challenging and, and knowing how to making sure that once you'd done an interview with someone that they were all right because actually you are unlocking some things that we maybe don't want to talk about but come out in the course of a I don't know, hour, hour and a half interview, or however long that might be. Yeah, I was just going to add, and that's maybe a different point, no, this issue of selection too, because um, some of the people we interviewed asked to close their interviews. So there's a number of um, interviews in the archive that we weren't able to use in the, the film or the article um, for various reasons to do with industrial relations, um, some people had really quite severe mental um, health issues that didn't want to, you know, um, have publicised. Uh, there were other people who had negative experiences on campus um, that didn't, again, want to speak out too publicly at this stage. So I suppose what's in the film and in the article uh, is, you know, represents a lot of people, but there's a, a whole segment of folk who we couldn't include in any publication that um, who are in the archive. Um, as well. So, yeah. And Stephen, just before we come to the uh, Q&A, uh, just one question from you in your role in this uh, as a historian, and it's a very, this is a very interesting hap, uh, experience in a way, because we have archivists and historians working together on jointly on a project from the very start. Uh, this isn't somebody coming to a, to a preset archive and saying, you know, can I have this for my work? Uh, and, I, and it would be interesting to hear about your reflections from all three of you on how how that went to the process. But Stephen, I was, I was sorry, you, you you talked in the the presentation about creative history and the importance of outputs that were well beyond the traditional academic article. Um, clearly, that has led to things like the public engagement that, that Sarah spoke about. The other thing I was wondering about was the the um, you mentioned in the film there are. Um, earlier forms of creativity such as novels films reference points and so on that are brought up in the interviews and I wonder to what extent people had a historical dimension to the comments that they were making were they placing the events of 2020 and 21 in some kind of historical dimension even if that was fictional or or created through a, a, a film or something like that it's a good question um I think you talk about this in your section of the article, Rosie, we're kind of struck by how rarely people, perhaps, for instance, referenced wartime. You know, although we can talk about this, relatively few people would bring it up as a comparison to their experience. So how much people historicised the pandemic um, in our interviews, I'm not sure it was especially explicit um, beyond this sort of general comment of it being, you know, unprecedented which I guess is only partially true, given, of course, <laughs> part of the point of we was discussing the article in the film, you know, part of the point of this whole experience is to realise that we have sort of become inured to public health issues being being part of our life. Historically, they have been. We've just become, we just 
prior to COVID. Oh, we stopped thinking that. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure how. Many, I, yeah, I'm not sure how many people really actively historicised it in the course of our interviews. Personally speaking, I think um, I talk about this in the article. It did. It did challenge my perception of the nature of history and how we should go about writing it. Certainly, um, and I hope to have communicated part of that in the article. But no, I'm not sure. How, yeah, would you? So. Uh, <clears throat> I was um, the person sort of doing all of the emailing right at the start of when we were getting mm. people volunteering for um, to interview. I was kind of doing all the admin on that. And I would say at least 50 percent of the people who volunteered for interview at some point in their email said, but I don't think I've got anything interesting to say. Yeah. Um, and and I, and I just I think that was actually mostly true for for. Uh, there's, you know, there's a decent skew. There's a fair amount of um, staff members from the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, for example, um, who perhaps are slightly more um, in tune with uh, history, the perception of history, that what they were living through might be historical. Um, but even, but e even within the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, I'm, I'm very much in, with non-academic staff and academic staff from across the university. The concept was. Uh, yeah, the interview sounds really interesting and fun. I would do it, but I don't think I've got anything very interesting to tell you, <laughs> which um, is bonkers because I, I spoke to some incredibly like fascinating um, people, jobs that didn't know existed at the university that then had such an incredible um, a, a sports psychologist who was talking about um, all the sorts of professional athletes here at the university and how that worked with um, the Tokyo Olympics getting postponed thing, things like this. Who had genuinely told me that he wasn't sure he had anything interesting to say? That's very interesting, and I suppose in a way, it's 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 reminding people that experience and emotion and a history of emotions is the valid subject. It is not something profound and 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 that you might expect in a different kind of history. So, in a way, maybe you were working to educate and 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 encourage people that their responses were valid historical response. You know, commentaries, data. Uh, to be used in this new historiography. Okay, um, we've got lots of questions and um, coming from the audience, and I think they divide really into two areas. One of sort of a, a practical questions, which I suspect are coming from the archivist section of the audience, um, uh, and others are more uh, more focused on the uh, impact on you, the continuation of the project, and so on. So, if I start by um, a couple of the former. Uh, uh, and I'll read out the names where, where they're given, but this is uh, from uh, somebody who hasn't given their name. Were you inspired by any other similar projects during the pandemic in the work? And are you, and I would add, are, are you now in touch with other projects that are have, are doing similar work in different contexts? So I'd say a couple of months after we started, um, I did talk to London School of Economics, who um, are the only other university I'm aware of that did a similar oral history projects on their own staff and students, um, or at least were planning on, I'm, I'm sure that they did. Um, so a couple of months into our project, I was chatting to them about sort of how we'd gone about it and um, the, the sort of nitty gritty practical stuff. Um, but I think, no, when, when we first started, that was, um, that was a bit spontaneous. <coughs> it was it was Stephen Slider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, and then, um... The, the paper trails uh, the publication that's hosting the article in the film. Um, so our uh, article appears as part of a wider um, edition of paper trails, which is all about um, the pandemic, creative and archival responses to it. Um, we approached them with our idea for the article in the film, and uh, paper trails is edited by um, Andrew Smith. Um, historian of France, um, he advertised more widely for responses uh, to our project. So a lot of the projects that are, that are um, written about in the paper trails update um, was responding to, to us. So I guess if I'm being a little bit big-headed, we were <laughs> uh, trying to lead uh, the conversation a little bit in terms of uh, archival historical responses to the pandemic. Um, and most of the ones we've been in contact with have been perhaps LAC you mentioned, and also through uh, paper trails, the publication itself. I was going to maybe add, I think the Remembering Together project, because originally 
um, I got involved to mentor one of the artists in that project and speaking to the organizers right at the start and saying, are you archiving this project? What are you doing? And it wasn't something they'd really kind of thought about. And maybe because I was doing the COVID project, I really nagged them and was like, you really need to think about how you're going to chronicle this because it's important. And maybe, you know, in the sort of like tangential way, the fact that this archive is now happening and will be deposited with Rosie is probably comes from our project and, and that kind of thinking because we were archiving what we were doing. If I'm getting involved with the other one, they should really think about what they were doing with their records as well. And we have a couple of questions, again, I think probably coming from the um, the professional archive side of the audience, but really focusing on that, that uh, the ethics of the project. And you talked a little bit about that in your presentation. Um, and it's very striking that clearly this was something that happened, had to be set up very quickly because you were living in real time and you needed to find people before they really did disappear in terms of connections and so on as, as we as we moved away from the university. Um, so two questions. Um, one of which uh, is anonymous, which is what are the data protection challenges around contemporary collecting like this, uh, which I think is sort of a, a, a sort of practical uh, uh, focus. And then one from Adam, which is uh, similar, but but a little more concerned with uh, the impact on you and, and those uh, taking part in the project. How did you navigate the ethics of such an emotional, personal and contemporary project? What systems did you put in place to protect your own mental health and or the well-being of your volunteers? So I can, I can talk a little bit about the contemporary collecting. Um, you, you know, we, we have the sort of standard forms to talk through with folk, what, um, how we can use their interviews, what, um, what kinds of, um, you know, is it okay for publication, is it okay for research? And uh, we did discuss closure periods. Um, I'd say the most the most challenging um thing was actually the diaries because um the amount of kind of third parties that get mentioned so so of course the person depositing the diary can say oh I'm really happy for anyone to read this but actually if you've disclosed personal information about somebody else then that becomes incredibly difficult and I do know there were projects um that had quite strict uh, projects sort of specifically around diaries during the pandemic that had quite strict um, rules about what people should be writing and they did say things like please don't mention any third parties at all and I considered doing that but I, I I felt like that might be very restrictive and considering we then took that kind of diary strand to a well-being project at the university felt a bit counterintuitive to sort of general mental health and well-being to um, be really really prescriptive about what students then could and couldn't write so um, so the diaries uh, are complicated but there is uh, only a handful of them so <laughs> thankfully it doesn't take up too much of my time to figure out um, what we can and can't make available from that but there's there's plenty of redactions that would happen for researchers for example um, and yeah, we yeah actually that's true. We did um we did let people use kind of pseudonyms um if that made them feel more comfortable as well. So a couple of the oral history interviews um have been pseudonymized um for publication, which yeah whatever made people feel comfortable um particularly with oral history, if if someone isn't comfortable, it's not going to be a very effective interview. So you have to try and make people um feel as comfortable as possible. I feel like there was there was a second part to that question. What was the second part to that question? Can I maybe talk about the the health and well being aspect and sort oh, of well, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think we were really conscious about that, that actually it it did come bring up emotions. So we did um Certainly with the students, we did oral history training with them and then also worked with them to work out the questions that they were they were happy to ask. So we had a, a, a sort of separate, very similar, but different themed questions that the students would ask and, 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 and we would ask of staff, because obviously it's different things that they're going through anyway. And then set up kind of, I don't know whether it was weekly, but kind of um, online sessions where we would meet in or virtually with the students and just be available for that hour just to have a chat about anything that had come up in the interviews they also between themselves did and uh Rosie Stephen and I um well we're all quite good friends so we we kind of would discuss things together in in terms of that if there was anything to do with the interviews that had been kind of 
upsetting or problematic but it was just a kind of ongoing being available for each other thing I think in terms of well-being and safeguarding making sure that everybody was happy with the process and certainly we wouldn't pressurize anybody to t undertake an interview if they didn't feel that they wanted or were able to do that. I've got a couple of questions from Rob Williams um, who's focusing really on the content of the uh, interviews and the diaries um, that you may want to speak about. And they, they take two, two forms really, one of which is the individual, because this is very much focusing on individual's responses and the emotional history that we talked about. Um, and Rob asks, were there clear patterns in emotional responses evident? So I suppose at the macro scale, is it possible to kind of start to talk about how people were responding? Um, and the second uh, comment that Rob makes, which is is very interesting, is did um, was there any commentary about the politics of the pandemic, the way that government was responding, the way that the authorities were responding? Uh, so in a way, taking it beyond the individual to a broader context, but certainly the the individual's experience of that governmental or authoritarian approach to um, handling this crisis. Yeah, I, I, I suppose think... we, we all, sorry, Rosie. No, yeah, you you were going to probably say the same thing as me, so go. <laughs> I was going to say, I did, it was one of the things we, I really hoped we'd get a COVID denier and we never did. <laughs> I, I, I kind of really thought we would get somebody who was, who was like, it, this doesn't exist, I don't want the vaccine, but we, I feel if there's a gap, that is not represented at all in, in the archive. Um, we did talk to people around sort of COVID rules, how they felt about them. And I always asked the question and said, you know, there's no judgment here. Did you obey the rules? Um, if you did, how did you feel about people who didn't obey the rules? So there was kind of those kind of questions. And um, in terms, I think, collective emotion around sort of anxiety about, I mean, we we started the interviews before there was a vaccine. So talking about will there be a vaccine and the kind of the anxiety around that, when will this end, will this end, um, that was really interesting. So politics, I think you can't really escape it in interviews like that. And I did ask, you know, how people felt about restrictions and I know we all did. So I think it, it kind of bled into it. Rosie, do you want to say something? Well, just really, I suppose because we have the Scottish Political Archive and uh, I'm the current archivist for that and Sarah's the previous archivist for that, we, we were mindful of. So we did try and ask everyone uh, about rules and restrictions because it was very pandemic related and that obviously bleeds into politics. But we did tend to ask people how they felt about communication from the government as well, um, pretty explicitly, just because that is something that interests us anyway. Um, I do think you probably watched most of the interviews, like more so than me and Sarah, so you probably have a better steer on emotions across the board you know yeah I, yeah i mean people did comment on the restrictions um some of the most interesting responses i heard uh, would have included people commenting on the sort of edi implications um of them and on the communication of the government and how oftentimes um, well-meaning communications were perhaps not couched in ways that were um, sympathetic to the widest possible audience. For instance, people were, you know, it's like the household idea was very sort of, you know, keeping to a certain household was very um, focused on, I guess, the nuclear family idea, which excluded various people. That came up from one or two people. Um, again, most people, nobody was a COVID denier. Nobody was saying things shouldn't have been done. Some people were more suspicious of or more more critical of of, of um, restrictions than others and I actually wonder if, if we're to go back and ask people now um what they think of the restrictions I wonder if they would be different again I, I, I speak for myself only but you do begin to wonder if some of it was a bit over the top but I would never have said that two years ago um you know so I, I wonder I wonder if people's views on the restrictions mean they'd be worth going back to ask about in the future but no, generally speaking, uh, any patterns across across the interviews in terms of emotion beyond the anxiety in the early stages, um, and people worried if it was appropriate uh, about how how it was going to impact upon um, existing health problems they would have had. Um, no, um, I guess amongst academics and academic, you know, staff at the university, of course, as discussed in the article in the film. There was an anxiety about jobs, of course. That's something that was was a big feature amongst uh, in, in the sector. So that was also quite a common feature. Once once the kind of anxiety faded a little bit around the danger of the virus, it was more focused on the economic 
um, uh, aftershocks of the, of the pandemic. So I, I would maybe say that, to be fair. Um, the interviews you might find if you listen to them, they might, they might focus a lot on the economics, on the sort of <laughs> on the worries, it was, you know, and the, and the restrictions they were causing, uh, you know, to, to sort of society and to the economy. So yeah, there's maybe more on that than there is on health, on on public health and on disease in the archives. I'd perhaps say that much. Thank you very much indeed. Well, um, unfortunately, we're coming up to the close at quarter to uh, two. So um, I, we had a good uh, a good review of many of the questions, and I think a lot of the other questions that were posed uh, were answered in some of the discussion. And I would reiterate, uh, if you haven't yet seen it and would like to watch the film an unusual period on specified length, uh, I would strongly recommend it because there are many of the many of the questions that were asked. Um, there'll be comments and responses that will be of interest to you um, in the film. So just before we uh, close, um, I just wanted to mention that History and Archives in Practice um, is uh, winding down for 2024. We had a conference in March. We've had a series of lunchtime conversations in July. Um, and we are now looking to um, make plans for activities in 2025. And there will be a call for papers uh, coming out in early August for our next one day conference that will be held in London on the 5th of March, 2025. So uh, look out at the TNA, IHR and RHS websites uh, and social media for the call for papers. And we hope very much that uh, archivists and historians will uh, contribute ideas for that, and there'll be a theme to that uh, for next year's um, conference that we'll be announcing in early August. Um, thank you also to the TNA, especially for organising this series and for running it so uh, effectively, and to all of the people that have spoken at it in the previous two uh, series. All of the uh, videos are now available for recording, and this one will follow shortly. Um, and then finally, just to thank um, our audience, of course, and for your questions and your attendance throughout the series. And most uh, importantly, to thank Sarah, uh, Rosie and Stephen for their contribution this afternoon um, and also for the project, which is a really worthwhile and valuable contribution to ways of looking at a significant historical event uh, through uh, emotions. So with that, um, we'll finish and I wish you all a very good afternoon and rest of the day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.